Hello, my name is Frank Downing, Director of Research for Next Generation Internet at ARC, and we're going to walk through the smart contract section of Big Ideas 2024. We believe smart contracts are serving as the foundation of a novel financial system that is native to the internet. Because it's built on public blockchains that are open and permissionless, this new financial system can be more global, automated, and importantly, auditable than today's system, removing financial intermediaries and lowering the cost to deliver uh, financial services around the world. Smart contracts are automated programs deployed on public blockchains that execute transactions according to a predefined set of rules and conditions. These contracts can be used to implement financial primitives like lending, exchange, and insurance, and combine to create much more complex financial instruments. Importantly, and distinct from our existing financial infrastructure, smart contracts live natively on the internet and can run without the need for centralized counterparties. Their use can thus lower fees and reduce counterparty risk. You can see on the chart uh, on the left side the largest smart contract networks by market value, led by Ethereum, the, one of the original smart contract blockchains launched in 2015, and a diverse group of alternatives that have launched since then. These blockchains combined generated a total of $3.7 billion in transaction fees in 2023. Uh, for reference, that's roughly equivalent with Visa's revenue in 2007. So material, but still quite early in its development. Now let's look at a few examples of how smart contract blockchains are being used. Stable coins are one of the major innovations uh, enabled by smart contracts. Stable coins are digital assets that track the price of a reference asset, most often the US dollar. This allows instant settlement and very low fees, particularly compared to the SWIFT payment system or other traditional global settlement methods. In 2023, over $10 trillion in value was settled via stable coins. That's more than MasterCard or PayPal uh, and approaching the value of Visa's global settlement uh, volume of 15 trillion. Uh, more, moreover, more than 1 million active addresses now use stablecoins daily. Uh, you can think of addresses as a surrogate for users for this context, uh, though some users may use more than one address. Uh, that's been nearly doubling each year over the last three years, growing at a 93% annual rate. Outside the dollar, we're also seeing other types of assets being tokenized on chains. Treasury funds are one example that has become popular in the higher rate environment that we've seen over the last year. Tokenization offers a novel means of establishing and tracking ownership for traditionally off-chain assets. Once assets exist on-chain, they can be more transferable and more easily collateralized for other use cases. The amount of Treasury funds increased on-chain uh, by more than sevenfold in 2023 uh, to $850 billion by the end of the year. Diving a level deeper now into the blockchains powering this financial revolution, we see that core developers of two of the largest smart contract networks by market value, Ethereum and Solana, made significant progress on their technical roadmaps during the bear market. Ethereum marked the completion of its transition from proof of work consensus to proof of stake in 2023 uh, by enabling withdrawals on the proof of stake network, uh, which resulted in a huge surge in Ether being staked in the network. Uh, and accomplishing a major milestone uh, that checks off a major, major box of technical risk on the roadmap. Solana, meanwhile, the high throughput alternative to Ethereum, which uh, it notably experienced several uh, periods of outages in the last bull market, shipped several upgrades that increased its resilience, leading to its longest period of sustained uptime in its history. There are now over 1,500 validators on the network, compared to below 400 in the first half of 2021, showing a significant amount of decentralization at the base layer. Another significant milestone has been the launch of layer two networks on Ethereum. Because Ethereum seeks to max maximize decentralization at the base layer, the Ethereum mainnet has limited throughput by design. Thus, to scale, uh, developers have chosen to focus on layer two networks uh, to be deployed on top of the mainnet that can move transaction execution off chain while still inheriting the security properties of Ethereum. Uh, while this has been the roadmap for Ethereum development for several years, it wasn't really until uh, last year that Layer 2 networks started to launch and scale in mass. Uh, there are now over 20 Layer 2 networks that have launched on Ethereum, uh, and in total, uh, they've scaled the average daily transactions in the Ethereum ecosystem by more than four, four times as, the end, as of the end of 2023. 
So with the rise of layer two networks, which not only scale the number of transactions that the ecosystem can accommodate, we're also seeing transaction fees come down. As you can see on this chart, uh, notable layer two networks that have launched on Ethereum like Optimism, Arbitrum, Base, and ZK Sync all sport transaction fees that are significantly lower than the average fee on Ethereum in 2023, which was $6.28. Uh, what you can see here on this chart is an analysis of how the average transaction fee relates to engagement. And we've borrowed a metric from uh, the world of social media to measure engagement here, uh, which is the uh, DAU to MAU ratio. Uh, so in the social context, this is the uh, average number of daily users on a network relative to the average number of monthly users on the network, or, or, or more simply, how many people are logging into the app daily to use it relative to the total user base. Uh, and you can see a clear trend here with uh, lower fees resulting in higher engagement on chain. Uh, so this is clearly a very important way to drive up additional uh, engagement and expand the scope um, of the number of people that are engaging in public blockchains. Uh, you can also see here outside of Ethereum and its layer two networks, Solana depicted with one of the highest engagement rates, uh, which has an average fee that is two orders of magnitude below even the ETH L2s at just a third of a penny to transact on average. Uh, this is uh, certainly a, a competitive dynamic that Solana has been um, seeking to emphasize in growing its user base. One might conclude from the prior slide that Solana is the clear winner because it offers lower transaction fees. But it's important to look at more than just one metric, as in reality, blockchains are designing around a series of trade-offs, and no single approach is the perfect solution. We can see this exemplified by both Ethereum and Solana's approach to scaling. While Ethereum has chosen to uh, rely on layer two networks to scale, uh, Solana's approach focuses on scaling maximally at the base layer. Uh, to take Ethereum, for example, uh, the decision to allow uh, the market to build layer two networks on top of the mainnet uh, really has fostered this environment of experimentation and, and allows for a high amount of customizability in terms of how each layer two network is created. You could even create a layer two network for a specific application or a specific sector like gaming. Uh, and that allows for uh, a high level of variety in approaches that um, the Ethereum ecosystem can support. Uh, but there are some trade-offs in that, particularly the increase in complexity for both users and developers that now need to worry about uh, which L2 should I deploy on or which layer are my assets on? Are they on the mainnet? Are they on base? Are they on optimism? Uh, there is still a lot of complexity that this puts on the end user uh, that, that results in um, really just a trade-off for this approach. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Solana has a, a much more simplified architecture, uh, which uh, by just scaling at the main layer and seeking to avoid layer twos, uh, maximizes interoperability between protocols on the network uh, and lowers the transaction fees at that base layer. Uh, but the primary trade-off here is that this requires much higher, uh, the much higher throughput has much higher requirements for what it takes to run a node on the network. These higher requirements limit the number of entities that can partake in network consensus by increasing the cost of participation. It's also unclear whether or not at full scale, Solana will also need layer two networks to scale similar to Ethereum's approach. Now, if we zoom all the way back out to the value proposition of smart contracts, let's look at our existing financial system. McKinsey estimates that uh, over $500 trillion in financial assets existed in 2020. That's stocks, bonds, bank deposits, et cetera. And the global financial services industry revenue was estimated to be about $17 trillion in that year. If you look at the financial services industry revenue as a percent of total financial assets, that represents roughly a 3.3% aggregate take rate. And one way to think of this is the cost to run the global financial system. Uh, there are many costs and friction points that we believe smart contracts could be able to help solve to make our, our global financial system more efficient. Uh, to give a few examples here, the, the cost to do a know your customer verification, that's the sign up process you do when you, when you sign up for a new brokerage account or a new bank, uh, on average costs between $1,500 to $3,000 per person for each institution that they're doing a KYC with. Uh, but with blockchain technology and the ability to have a, a secure digital identity issued on chain, 
uh, we have the potential to reduce those costs by allowing an individual to do one KYC and have a, a, an address that represents that uh, KYC credential that can be leveraged across many different institutions and lower that cost so it doesn't need to be incurred for every person every time they uh, try to be authenticated to a, a new service provider. Another example is the NASDAQ listing fee. To list on an exchange, the, um, the NASDAQ fee alone is 200, around $270,000 on average, and there's a, a, an additional premium that is built, charged annually. The cost of going through the investment banking process to list uh, adds to this uh, in, in orders of magnitude. Uh, with decentralized exchanges, you have the ability for any asset to be listed on an exchange and liquidity provided by uh, a global network of market makers uh, for, for next to no cost. Uh, this is a, a dramatic efficiency that we see happening at the fringes in uh, the decentralized finance world that we think could bring tremendous efficiency when applied to the broader base of financial assets. Looking ahead to 2030, our research suggests that if 5% of the world's financial assets move on chain, at an adoption rate similar to that of the early internet uh, from where we are today. Uh, and smart contracts command a, a much smaller fee than the traditional financial institutions, 1% versus over 3%. Smart contracts could generate $450 billion in gross fee revenue by 2030. Uh, and the decentralized applications that they uh, create could command over $5 trillion in market value.